All right, do me a favor. If you have a Bible, electronic device, go ahead and grab it, and I'm going to tell you, uh, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 12. We're going to spend a majority of our time in Deuteronomy chapter 12. It's in the early parts of your Bible. So today we're beginning a new series, and uh, whenever I begin a new series, it, it, I have to do two things in the first message. One is to introduce the series, what it is we're going to be talking about over the next five weeks, but then to have the first week's teaching. So I want to spend the first time just introducing this series, and then we're going to go a little bit deeper. And let me just tell you what I hope to accomplish today. It's very much a teaching. Um, I'm going to, at, at one point today, go over eight different ways that we can seek after God. I would love for you to take notes. I'd love for you, even if it's on your phone, grab a piece of paper, a pen, because we, the reason why we teach these truths is we believe that these truths applied to our lives can bring life transformation. And, and every teaching is a little bit different, but this one is a, is a kind of a long, thorough teaching where we're looking at all these different topics. But here's what I want to do. At the end of today's teaching, if I can remember to do so, I want to do this, is I want to ask you to respond physically by holding up fingers, because we're going to look at eight different ways to see God of the different ways that you've been challenged to go deeper in your pursuit of God. And so I want you to look through the list, kind of meditate on there, and then we're going to respond at the end. Uh, if you're around me for any amount of time, there's a phrase that I use frequently. So if you're a friend of mine or if you were to be on staff, and I, I even say this on the stage periodically, so many of you have heard it, but there's a phrase I use where I say, I just can't imagine doing life alone. And when I say it, I mean, though I love my wife, I'm not talking about my marriage. And though I love my children, I'm not talking about my family. And though I love my friends, I'm not talking about those relationships. When, when I talk about the idea that I can't imagine doing life alone, I am talking about my relationship with God. The idea of going through life without God's involvement in my life is legitimately overwhelming to me. I just can't imagine, and I know it's, it's heartbreaking to me because I know there are many people that are experiencing life without God's involvement, and I just can't imagine it. But even when I say a relationship with God, I want to take a moment and define that because I think every single one of us look at that concept a little bit differently. When I say a relationship with God, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about God's felt presence, that God interacts with us, that God is in a relationship with us. Because I want to be clear, when I say relationship with God, I'm not talking about being in a relationship with knowledge of God. I'm not just studying a, a dead concept. I'm not studying a concept about some religion where there are all these rules and practices that we have to follow, and it's, I go through these rote behaviors and therefore feel like I'm connected to God. That's not what, at all what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a relationship where I am in a, a relationship where, we've, where I feel the presence of God. What I mean by that is I speak to God believing that he hears the words that I'm speaking. He hears the cries of my heart. God speaks back to us. It's not typically in an audible voice, but God still effectively communicates. I believe I speak to God. God speaks to me. I have experienced in my life so many things that it becomes a very tangible thing to me. I have felt the comfort of God. The times in my life where I am hurting, where I am heartbroken, where I've been devastated by loss, where I have been overwhelmed by situations, and in a moment, all of that changes because of a feeling, and what that is is the presence of God. So I have felt his comfort. I have felt his empowerment. I felt his conviction. I feel that frequently throughout my day, that God will just challenge me, that there are things that need to change in my life. I feel all of this, and so when we talk about a relationship with God, this is what I'm talking about, and I hope that you have felt the presence of God. If not, we're going to talk about how that can happen in our lives today, but I hope you've experienced that because for me, it really is the standard of life. You, you can define life and think about all the value that life can offer you because our world has so many pleasures that it offers. But in my opinion, from my experience and from the truth of God's word, is nothing compares to being in a relationship with God. All the pleasures of this world pale in comparison to what God can offer. And when you're in a relationship with God, the pleasures that he offers are, are blessed and they're way more satisfying than anything this world has to offer. And so we're, we're looking at this idea of being close to God, experiencing a relationship with God. And truthfully, you know, one of the, the, the most frequent compliments we get as a church is people talk about how we emphasize a relationship with God. That many people, even people that have been a part of churches have said that we were raised hearing about God, but never emphasized relating to him, connecting to him. So again, this is our emphasis, but we're really looking at it from both sides because this series that we're beginning today is called Closer and the subtitle is When God Feels Distant. 
Because as beautiful and wonderful as it is to feel his presence, I think if we're honest, there are times that we, that I'll just say it this way, there are times that God feels distant. Is that fair? Will you respond? Is that fair? Yes. There are just times that for whatever reason, God doesn't feel as close. And I experience that. Though I love reading the word of God, I'm, I'm thankful that God has wired me that way. I love reading the word of God. But there are times I read it and it feels like words on a paper. It feels like a book. There are times that I'm praying and it feels like my words are just bouncing off the ceiling. Have any of you ever experienced that? Where you're just talking and you feel like, is anything even happening? There are times in worship where it just feels like I'm singing songs. And, and there are times that God feels distant. There are times where we're exhausted. There are times that we're distracted. There are times we just had these dry seasons. Where it's not, times where we're stressed and we're overwhelmed. And we look at this and we go, man, it, it's such a weird dynamic because on one hand, we know the value of connecting to God and to experiencing his presence. On the other time, he feels distant. And so here's the question. When God feels distant, is he actually distant? Is that a reflection of God leaving us? Is that a reflection of maybe God's discipline? Is that a reflection of a punishment? Is that, is that signifying to us that God is really an absent God, that he's hands off? I, I remember years ago, someone said this phrase, and it was just kind of a cute, clever phrase, and it kind of stuck with me, and they said, if God feels distant, he isn't the one who moved. And I remember thinking, that gets to the point, doesn't it? That's blunt, it's very clear, it's kind of clever. But do you know what else, when we look at the scripture, what else about that saying is it's 100% true. It's not God who has left. I love the way that David worded this. Psalm 139. This will be on the screen. David said it this way. And what David describes right here really is a comprehensive understanding of God's involvement in our life. But he says, oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. Let's just pause there. David is describing the way that he relates to God. This is the psalm, in case you, you're wondering, that later on he'll say, you knit me together in my mother's, wombs. You my mother's womb, you have all my days planned out for me. So like, it's a really famous psalm. But he begins by saying, God, like you're not distant. You've searched me. You've known me. Scripture tells us that the Spirit has, has searched out the thoughts and motivation of man. Like God knows everything about us. And this is what David is declaring, God, you're not disconnected. You've searched me. You've known me. So this means God knows our personalities because he designed us. He, he knows our stresses and our anxieties. He knows what brings joy to our lives. He knows us. He goes on and says, you know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I, I cannot attain it. Then he asked these questions. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol or the grave, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. I mean, as you hear those words, isn't it clearly communicating that our God is not a distant God, that he's involved? And this is a God who is involved relationally. This is a God, I mean, I want you to feel this. This is a God who is involved mentally and emotionally, and spiritually. I mean, all that David is describing. So a God, if he's not actually distant, why does he feel distant? And I think we've all experienced this dynamic, at least in relationships. Have you ever been right next to someone in physical proximity and yet relationally feel like on the other side of the earth? Where it's like, I mean, you're right there and we're looking at each other and we're talking. Are some of you elbowing the person next to you right now? You know, like that tension where you're like, man, we're just not seeing eye to eye. Well, why is it that we have that same experience with God? He's not distant. He hasn't abandoned us, and yet he feels distant. Well, this is what we're going to look at in this series. I think, and this is my opinion, and I like to kind of different, uh, show the difference between when it's my opinion. Uh, in my opinion, I think the two main reasons that God feels distant from us 
is the first one is because of choices we make. I think we make choices that cause God to feel distant. So we're going to look at that. But I think the other reason why God oftentimes feels distant from us is when life goes in an unexpected way. The mysterious ways of God cause him at times to feel distant because our lives go in places we never expected or never desired to go. And at times we, we can feel like maybe life is out of control and maybe we get frustrated with God. And so what we're going to look at today, we're going to look at step one, where this all begins about getting closer to God. Weeks two through four, we're going to look at the choices that we make and how that impacts how God feels in our lives and how we can correct those. And then in the final week of this series, we're going to look at what it means when life goes in an unexpected way and how we can respond to that. Because this is what I'm confident in scripture. I'm confident that God shows us a way to get closer to him. And I want you to hear this. God wants you to get closer to him. He's not a God who's messing with us. He's not a God who's trying to manipulate. He is a loving father who consistently puts out an invitation. Will you come after me? Will you approach me? But we make the decision. We make the choices. And this is what we're going to look at today. And so this is where I want to begin. I want to begin with a simple question that every single one of you, I'm confident, can get correct. All right. So let's use this table as the, as the, the focal point. If I am this far away from the table and I want to get closer to the table, so I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to physically respond, okay? If I want to get closer to the table, what do I need to do? Ready? Did anyone get this wrong? You guys are like, what's the answer? If I want to get closer, I need to get closer to the table. I need to walk toward the table, right? Anyone get that wrong? You're not going to raise your hand, are you? Some of you were like, probably said something that was a little bit out of the box. You need a cartwheel to the table. You know, that's an option. But when we look at this, it's super obvious. If I'm away from a table, I take steps away and I want to get closer, I need to take steps toward it. We understand this in the physical, but we also understand this in every capacity of our lives. If there's something we want to get closer to, there are things that we have to do in order to get closer to it. You want to get closer to a person. There is, are things that you can do in a relationship to get closer. You need to communicate. You need to spend quality time together. There needs to be a moment of vulnerability and transparency where you start to express to them the different emotions and feelings you have. The more you give of yourself, the closer you can get in a relationship. If you want to get a new job, there are things that you have to do in order to secure a new job. If you want to increase in education, there are things that you need to do. We get this. When there's something that we desire, there are choices and decisions that we have to make in order to achieve it. It is no different in our relationship with God. There was at one point something that separated our ability to get closer to God, and that was our sin. But when Jesus took our sin upon his sinless body, died on the cross for our sins, and was resurrected, he removed that that gap, but we still have decisions that we have to make in order to get closer to God. So here's the truth that this entire series has to be built upon. If you want to be closer to God, you must, everyone say it with me, seek God. If you want to be closer, there are things that you have to do to seek after him. And so here's the logical question. We go, okay, but what does it actually look like to seek God? It's super obvious if we're talking about in the physical of walking, taking steps toward a table, but if this table represents God and we feel distant from God, what are the behaviors that we do that cause us to take steps toward him? And when we look at it, what we're going to look at today is we're going to look at the nation of Israel. God created a nation. I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but God created a nation and he did so because he wanted to relate to them as a model for the rest of the world to see what it means to be in a relationship with God. And when God set them free, they were, they were in slavery, and this was part of God's plan where he was shaping them into a nation. But when God set them free, he led them to the land that he promised to give them. And this was the heart of God. He was going to lead them into this land, and there were many wicked nations there. He was going to use them to drive the nations out, to destroy them. And then they were going to settle in this land. God was going to bless them in its supernatural ways. They were going to have the abundant blessing of God. God's presence would be with them. They would have their tabernacle that would one day become the temple. God's presence would be with them. If they walked in obedience, God was going to bless them. This was the ideal. And as they were getting ready to move into the promised land, God gave them this warning, this instruction on what it would mean to continue to have the presence of God with them. And I'm going to give you the truth, and then I'm going to show you it in Deuteronomy 12. But here's the truth God gives them. 
You seek God in the way and at the place he chooses. Now, I want this to be something, I would love for you if you're taking notes to write this down. I want this to sink into your mind and heart. And the reason why is we live in a culture that teaches us the opposite of this truth. God was saying, you cannot approach me any way that you want. There is a correct way and there's a correct place. He was going to have one location, his tabernacle that would become his temple. There's going to be one location. And God says, and there were ways that you're going to relate at that one location with me. But here's what our culture tells us. Our culture tells us literally that we can create our own version of truth, however we want to. We can create our own version of what heaven is going to be like, and then we can create whatever pathway we think will get us to our imaginary heaven, that we can live however we want, and as long as it's your truth, then it's okay. And so what happens is that way of thinking creeps into our relationship with God, and we think we are empowered to create our own version of how we're going to relate to God. But is that what scripture tells us? Is that what God communicates? Deuteronomy 12, 4, he says to them, as you're about to go into this land and destroy all these nations, destroy all their idols, he says this, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. Let's pause. What way is he talking about? in the ways that every other nation worshiped their God. They're going into a land where people, they worship their gods through, some of them, through the sacrificing of their babies. They would literally burn them in, in worship to their gods. Other nations would worship God through sexuality. They would have temples and they would have prostitutes that were part of men and women, and people would go and they would engage in sexual activities as a way to worship their gods. Many of them, all of them built statues and they built temples, and they built altars and, and there's all different ways that they worship their gods. What God is saying to them is as you go into this land and you destroy these nations and you destroy their idols and their altars and their temples, he's letting them know you're not going to worship me in the way that the rest of the world worships their God. And this is truth still today. That God is saying to us, if you want to approach me, if you want to experience my presence, you don't do it in the way that you create. You do it in the way that I reveal to you. He goes on in verse five, but you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose. This will eventually be Jerusalem. You will seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and to make his habitation there. There you shall go and there you shall, and he starts to give specific things that they can do. But in that one verse, the end part of it, there you shall go and there you shall, and he starts to list behaviors. What God is communicating, we'll put the truth up again, you seek God in the way and at the place he chooses. And I want you to feel the weight of this for a moment. We don't get to determine how we're going to seek God. To use this analogy again, if God is represented by this table and we are distant from God and we want to get closer to God, we don't get to choose the behaviors that actually cause us to get closer to God. God does. God gets to define it for us. And this has always been his model. So what we're looking at today was something that was foreshadowing a deeper truth. Let me just be honest with you. At this time, there was one place, Jerusalem, and then the temple. There was one place they would go. We no longer have to go to Jerusalem. There is no actually a temple there. It was destroyed in AD 70, but we don't have to go back there. Even if a temple was built, we don't have to go back there. It's no longer a specific place, but there is a mental and emotional and spiritual place that God still calls us to. And the reason why this matters is because many of us are pursuing God, not in the way that God communicates. And so God's telling them there is a right way and there's a wrong way. There are two stories in the Bible that illustrate this, I think, in a very powerful and sobering way. Here's the first. When God first created the tabernacle and he had them built it, his presence would, would dwell in the holy of holies, the most sacred part of this place. And God told them only one person, the high priest, one day a year on the Day of Atonement can go into this place. And God even specifically said who these people would be. First, it would be Aaron, that he was the brother of Moses. 
Aaron would be the high priest and he would be allowed into this. But once Aaron passed away, it would have to be one of his descendants, so one of his sons, and then it would be passed on. But it would have to be a descendant specifically from Aaron who could be the high priest who could experience his presence. And so God's presence fills the temple. Aaron gets to experience it. And then one day, for whatever reason, and scripture doesn't really tell us the motivation, Aaron's two sons decided that they were going to go into the Holy of Holies. And they actually took some of the elements that were a part of the normal worship. They took incense that they had, and they were going to go into the presence of God. And they just decided, we're going to approach God how we want to approach God. And the moment they stepped into the Holy of Holies, God struck them both dead by sending fire. And it probably wasn't a literal fire as we understand it, more of just the overwhelming presence of God. But both of them were struck dead in the moment. And Aaron was devastated at the loss of his sons, and and people were terrified. And they were actually even somewhat frustrated with God. But then God spoke to them and told them, you will not approach me any way that you deem appropriate. You will approach me in the ways that I have commanded of you. What God was showing them is there is an invitation to experience the presence of God. But it doesn't happen by our own logic. It doesn't happen by what makes us feel good, what seems right to us. It happens through following the pathway of God. There's another story. Many years later, about 400 plus years later, the nation of Israel, this, it's kind of a strange story, but they lose the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was this box that was in the Holy of Holies. It contained the Ten Commandments and some other things that God told them to put in there. But it represented the presence of God, and they lost it, and it was located at another nation. And so King David, when he comes to power and he conquers these nations, he decides he's going to bring the Ark of the Covenant back, and they're going to rebuild the tabernacle. And, and so they start to bring it back, but here's the problem. They don't do it in the way that God has commanded. And how God commanded was there was two loops on either side of the Ark of the Covenant, and they were supposed to uh, put wooden uh, posts through them, and the priests would put it on their shoulders, and they would carry it. Instead, they took this, and they lifted it up onto a cart, and they had two oxen pull it, probably because it was physically easier than men having to carry it. And while it was on its way back to Jerusalem, the cart became unstable. And as it started to tip, a man by the name of Uzzah stuck his hand up and put it on the Ark of the Covenant to stabilize it. And in the moment that he touched it, God struck him dead. And it was terrifying. It was sobering. And even David was upset and he was confused. And David thought, God, is it that you don't want your presence in the Ark of the Covenant to be brought back into the community? I mean, how can we ever connect and worship with you? And God's response to him is, you can have my presence, but you have to do it in the ways that I command you to do it. And later on, when they brought the Ark of the Covenant back, they did it in the proper way. And God's presence was restored to Israel. And the reason, again, why this is so sobering is in modern day Christianity, we choose to approach God in the ways that seem fitting to us. It's what I often refer to as the grocery store style Christianity. See, when we go to the grocery store, let me make an assumption, respond to this, okay? Is it safe to say when you go to the grocery store, you do not take one of everything? Is that fair, right? You go and you pick and choose, And not only do you pick and choose, but as you're going down and you're looking at different things and you put some stuff in your cart and you ignore some stuff, there are even times that the further you go, you start to second guess your choices and then you're too lazy to go back and put it where it is. So you wait till you're checking out and you hand it to the person for them to take it back, right? Anyone feel conviction by that? You should. Okay. (laughs) But what is that? It's because we have the right to pick and choose. And then we approach God the same way. That God tells us the things that we can do to experience his presence. God tells us the pathways to get closer to him. And we walk through our faith journey. And there are some things we look at on the shelf that God commands. And we go, absolutely, that makes sense to me. I want to do that. And then we get to something else and we look at it and we say, I don't want that. Or not now. Or we start to live in obedience in some areas, but then we start to second guess. And then we later put it back on the shelf. And we think this is okay. And then we wonder why we're distant from God. We're wondering why we don't have the power in our lives to live overcoming lives and effective lives. And the reason is, is because we're approaching God in a way he's never allowed and he's never commanded. And this should be a sobering thing to us. I mean, Jesus himself, when he was here on earth, in Matthew 25, he gives multiple different accounts of the same truths that are illustrated. And the truths that he communicates is that one day there's going to be a judgment. And this is the part that's so sobering. When, they, when people stand in judgment before the Father and God separates them, 
And there are those that are, are rewarded in, with eternal life, and there are those that are rejected by God to be eternally separated from him. What's so sobering are the people who are rejected by God are shocked that they're rejected by God. I mean, they even say things like, didn't we do this in your name? And didn't we do all these things? And God's response to them is, I never knew you. I want you to think about the weight of that. That there are people that if you were to go up to them and ask them and say, are you in a relationship with God? With total confidence, they would say yes. And yet they're not. How in the world does that happen? It happens because people approach God in their own way and they reject the ways of God and they have convinced themselves that that is accepted by God. And so what we're looking at today is how is it that God actually commands us to seek him? I'm going to go through this very quickly. There are eight things. And I want you to know this. This is eight things where God is not playing hard to get. These are eight things that he's made known to us. And as we go through these, I want you to mark what are ones that you're not doing effectively and those that you are so that we can respond this week. I'm going to go through these quickly. Here's the first. You seek God by obeying God. And from that brings freedom and blessing, as we'll see. But you seek God by obeying God. Here's where he begins, Deuteronomy 12, 1. These are the statutes and rules that you shall be careful to do in the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. God begins with saying, you will obey me. Now, I want everyone to understand this truth. It is impossible to seek after God while walking in obedience, disobedience, I should say. You're like, whoa, that's a, I did not see that one coming. Okay. <laughs> Explain that more. Okay. Let me try it again. Pause. Ready? Here we go. It is impossible to seek after God while walking in disobedience. Disobedience is the opposite of pursuing God. And we need to let the weight of that sink in because disobedience can be very subtle in our minds and yet it's not subtle in God's mind. What disobedience is, is any time that God has communicated to us his expectations, his commands, his statutes, his laws, where God has commanded it and our response is to say no. And hear me, if your response to God is to say not now, that is the same thing as saying no. Until you say yes, it is a no. It is disobedience. And there are so many people that wonder why God feels distant. They wonder why life doesn't seem to have all of the promises and blessings that God offers. And yet when you look at their life, the truth of it is there are many places where we've said no to God. And, and truthfully, as a pastor, this is one of the most common responses I give to people. And anyone that's a part of our church knows this. I do not have a legalistic bent. I very much celebrate grace. This is not a, a legalistic statement, but people will come to me and they'll say, I just don't feel God's presence like I used to. And here's my advice. This is where I begin. Search your heart. Allow the Holy Spirit to search your heart and just try to discover the last time that God commanded something of you that you said no and go back to that place and say yes and see if you won't feel God's presence differently. Because that's been my experience my own life. When I tell God not now, when I tell the, the same anointing that God has for our lives. But when I start to walk in obedience, I consistently feel God's presence in a different way. And when we feel God's presence, it leads us to experience incredible blessing. And the first one is freedom. I, I love the way that Jesus words this. John 8, 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, and if you've been a part of our church, you know this, in my opinion, is the most misquoted scripture in the Bible. He says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Why I think that's misquoted is people just stop at the part, truth will set you free. They need to go back. Here's what Jesus says. If you abide in my word, if you live in my word, what he's, the assumption of his statement is that you are obeying what he's commanded you to do. And he gives this, this thing, this cause and effect. If you live in my word, obey them, live them out, then you are truly my disciples. You're truly following me. And if you're truly following me, then you will know the truth. Let's just pause there for a moment. Many people, because they do not obey God, never actually discover the truth. Hear me. What you have is information. 
If you come on a Sunday and you listen to a pastor teach or you read your Bible and you, and you discover a truth, you have information. Once that information is applied to your life, it becomes true to you. I, I, I've said this numerous times, but I can tell you all the different types of theoretical things. But it's just information until you live it out. Once you live it out, you discover the power, the power of God. It becomes truth to you. And this is what God says. If you abide in my word, then you're truly my disciples. If you are truly my disciples, you will know the truth. And if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And when you God, it is one of the most powerful ways that you sense his presence. When you have, have had something that has held you in bondage for years and God sets you free, it's a powerful moment. When you've been addicted to, to sex and to pornography and God sets you free, when you've been addicted to drugs and alcohol and destructive behavior, addicted to shopping and lying and gossiping, when you have felt seasons of anxiety and depression, things that have overwhelmed you and God sets you free from that, that is a powerful moment where his presence is real to you. And this is why God wants us to walk in obedience. He's not given us some bizarre checklist of behaviors, like you need to climb a mountain every third day. You know, some odd behavior where we're just like, what are we doing this for? Every command of God is given to lead us toward freedom because his commands are based on how he's designed us to live. And so we find freedom, but then in freedom, we also find blessing. And this is what he said in the couple of verses right before where we study today, chapter 11, verse 26 of Deuteronomy. He says, see, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today. Here, guys, hear this. God wants to bless you. Isn't that an incredible thought? I feel like there are some things I say that it's fairly obvious that I want a response. That would be one of them, right? <laughs> Isn't it awesome that God wants to bless you? The creator God? Thank you. That was awesome. All right. <laughs> but I mean, think about it. Would you rather have $10 from the world or $1 blessed by God? I'd rather have $1 blessed by God. The, the idea that the supernatural God, the creator God is giving you favor is an incredible thought. Why does God bless obedience? Because he wants to see that behavior repeated. And so when we want to see God, we have to begin in obedience. All right. I have to get through the other seven in like four minutes. So here we go. Number two, you seek God by destroying idols in your life. These nations, as God commanded them to go in, Israel, to go in and to conquer these nations, I want you to note the aggressive language that God uses. He says, you shall surely destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess served their gods, on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. You shall tear down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and burn their ashram, which is a form of idol, with fire. You shall chop down the carved images of their God and destroy their name out of that place. Every single place that they go and conquer, God doesn't say, like, leave it as a memorial, leave it as a reflection, as a museum that you can go back and visit later. He goes, no, in every single place with a, an aggressive behavior, destroy the idols that you come across, destroy the ways that they worship their gods, just remove it from your nation, remove it from your culture. Why? Because all of those false gods were a temptation to draw the hearts of Israel into worshiping other gods. And, and this is what's so subtle. In our world, we don't typically, at least in the American culture, do not typically create statues and altars that we bow down before. And yet our nation is just as much controlled by idolatry, idols, as any other nation in history. Whatever it is, so th this group of people that they were going in, their false gods dictated to them how they were going to think and feel and therefore behave how they thought that God wanted them to operate, it, it consumed them, it controlled them. And yet, if you stop and you pause and you reflect on your life, isn't it fair, this is rhetorical, you don't need to respond to this one, isn't it fair that there are things in our lives today that control how we think and how we feel and therefore how we behave? We put so much energy in pursuing pleasure, so much energy in pursuing money, the increase in money, and what it can provide, bigger houses, nicer cars, new clothes, experiences, vacations, whatever it might be. 
We spend so much time in shaping our brand or our image to the world. We spend so much time pursuing the activities even of our children. And we spend so much time in hobbies. And we spend so much time with our jobs and so much mental and emotional energy. Whenever there's something that controls how you think and feel and therefore how you behave, that is an idol, a false god. And God's response to his people is, if you want to seek me and find me, it has to continue with the destructions, the aggressive destructions of idols in your life. And for some of you, if you pause and took stock of your life, you would start to become clear to you the idols that you have allowed to become a part of your life. Politics, social media, the pursuit of money, the pursuit of relationships. And if you want to experience God's presence in a deeper way, you have to be willing to surrender those idols to God. Here's number three. You see God in confession and repentance. Verse four, he says, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. We've already read this. We're going to go a little bit deeper. But you shall seek the place that the Lord your God shall choose out of all the tribes to put his name and to make his habitation there. There you shall go, and there you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices. When God established the tabernacle, what it was was a place when when the people realized that they had broken the laws of God, they could come and make sacrifices for their sins so that their sins could be forgiven. But here's what would have to be logically the process that they would be going about through their lives and they would realize there's something that they have done that disobeyed God, that dishonored God. And in response to that, they wanted to make amends. So just imagine if if they were going through their lives and they realized they they stole from someone and they, they wanted to make amends. They would obviously need to return what they stole, but then they would go back to the temple and in offering their sacrifice, they were saying to God, I recognize that the behavior that I did was wrong. I'm confessing that to you. I'm, I'm verbally acknowledging that I agree with you, God. This was sin, but also repenting. Repenting, the literal definition means to change your mind. So I was walking this way. I was living this way. I realize it's wrong. I'm repenting from that. I'm confessing it to you, God. I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm making a sacrifice. Will you forgive me? Friends, do you want to connect to God in a deeper way? There should be a consistent rhythm in your life of confession and repentance, where you're going before God in a specific way saying, God, I want to acknowledge the things that I've done in my life that I know are displeasing to you. As the Holy Spirit convicts you, as you become aware of behaviors in your life that maybe you were ignorant of before, the proper response is to go to this loving God where you can find mercy and grace and confess your sins so that he can forgive you so that you can go deeper into relationship with him. What's awesome is now we don't go and make sacrifices. You know why? Because Jesus has already made the one time eternal sacrifice for our sins. Jesus became the spotless lamb, sacrificed on our behalf. He took our sin upon his body. He was crucified. He died. He came back to life. So when we go to God in faith, we are applying the work of Jesus to our sins. But there needs to be a moment where we're going to God and we're saying, God, I'm acknowledging what you've convicted me on. One of the practices that I've encouraged you as a church for many years is don't just simply make a blanket statement where you say, God, forgive me of all my sin. Though I believe he still forgives you, I think there's value in going to God and saying, God, forgive me of this specific sin. Acknowledging our pride, acknowledging our selfishness, acknowledging our lust, acknowledging our dishonesty, acknowledging whatever it is that the Holy Spirit has convicted us with. Here's the next thing he says, the fourth truth. You seek God in giving to God in tithes and offerings. The very next verse, he says, and there you shall bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices. He continues, your tithes, which is 10% of their gross income, your tithes and contributions, which is offerings above and beyond, that you present your vow offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. All of that is is generous response, and it has a financial element to it. Friends, I want you to hear this, because this is oftentimes overlooked. One of the most powerful ways that you can seek after God and connect to God is surrendering control of your finances to him. I have been consistent in this teaching for years because this is a truth I'm thankful for that God has revealed to me actually when I was a child and it's never differed, never wavered from this. That Jesus said the most important thing ever said about finances. He said, wherever your treasure is, there your heart is. There is just a unique connection between your heart and finances. 
And if your treasure and finances are connected, what Jesus is declaring is, is it is impossible to give your heart completely over to God without giving your finances and resources to him. God has not asked us to give 100%, but he has commanded us to give 10% and to go above and beyond in offerings. This is a truth that has been illustrated throughout the entire Bible, including the New Testament. And God wants us to give it, not because God is broke, not because God has ever needed money, because this is a pathway where we can say to God, God, I believe you are my provider. See, one of the, the I think the dangerous parts of sin is it distorts our own hearts into thinking we're truly our own providers. And the only way we break that, what the Bible calls the spirit of mammon, this idea that we just run after money, the only way we break that is to give it over to God and allow him to supernaturally reveal to us that he's our provider. And so he's commanding them right in the beginning. He goes, guys, come to me, repentance, confession, come to me in tithes and offerings. Then let's go on. Number five, you seek God in his word, the Bible. In Hebrews chapter four, I love how this is worded, verse 12. He says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing through the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. I love this because the Bible is different than every other document we've ever experienced. Because any other book you just read and you can draw some truths out of it, but this is what the writer of Hebrews is declaring. And any one of you that have ever studied the Bible have experienced this. What he's saying is when you read the Bible, the Bible reads you. When you interact with the Bible, the scriptures interact with you. And there are just things that you will never learn about yourself until you read the scriptures. Every time you read the Bible, you're given an opportunity for the Spirit of God to work with you and to show you the things in your life that need to change so that you can experience more fully what God has for you. But here's what he says in the final verse that we'll look at. He says, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. That sounds super fun, doesn't it? To be naked and exposed, like that sounds terrifying. I've told you numerous times, probably more times than you'd like to hear, I keep having this reoccurring nightmare where I show up in public places and I'm not wearing pants. I don't know why I keep having it, but I do. But it's a, a horrible feeling to, to feel vulnerable, to feel exposed in any way. And yet what he's talking about here is the opposite. The person that you're being exposed in front of is the one who loved you enough to take the form of his creation and in every way was tempted like humanity. We are exposed in front of a loving, grace-filled God who wants to expose things never to shame, never to use guilt. That's not strategies of God, but he wants to expose them so that we will meet him there, surrender those things to him, turn from them so that we can experience more fully the life he offers us. And for some of you, you are missing out on a way to discover more fully the character and nature of God because you do not make studying scriptures a priority. And in modern day technology, we are all without excuse. In modern day technology, there are so many incredible resources that are available to you to make the word of God be understandable. And the Holy Spirit can meet you there, but you have to prioritize it. Number six, you seek God in the holy of holies. And this is how I'm describing prayer. The writer of Hebrews also said it this way. He said, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. I love the imagery of this, that when we pray, when we worship, we are actually, our words in our presence are actually going into the very presence of God himself, the Holy of Holies. Years ago, I had a youth leader that was, uh, when I was a student, that was one of our youth leaders. I would later on become youth pastor at this church in Detroit, and he became one of my leaders. But I remember when I was a student, and he was talking to us one day, he was leading us in worship, and he was talking to us, and he said, here's one thing that I do that helps me in worship. And he said to me many, many years ago, I mean, I'm, I'm going to turn 44 next week, and I still remember it. But he said, when you go into worship, He's like, just picture this, picture God sitting upon his throne in heaven. And imagine heaven however you want to, but just imagine this glorious place and God is there. And you get the opportunity in worship and in prayer to step into his presence. And I remember as a kid thinking, that's cool. <laughs> that's a cool thought. 
And I'll tell you, as an adult, I remind myself often of this truth when I pray, that my words are not just staying in the room where I pray, or if I'm driving, or if I'm in my house, that my words are taking me into the presence of the living God. And what an incredible honor that is. And in his presence, God meets me, and he changes me, where I pray things that I think I want, and God shows me something different. In prayer, where God starts to show me the flaws of my character. Again, never to shame or to guilt, but it's because he knows there's a deeper life for me. The times I, in prayer where I have just been struggling, and yet in prayer I just feel peace. Where I'm anxious about something, where I'm confused about something, and I'm praying, and all of a sudden that's taken away. What is that? We're stepping into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. That place that in history only one person one day a year got to enter into, we get to enter into any time that we pray and worship God. But do we make prayer a priority? Jesus encouraged us to have a prayer closet, not a literal place, but a figurative place where we could just be be separated from distractions and make God a priority. Do we have that in our day-to-day lives? Here's the seventh one. You seek God in praise. Another way is in worship. In Psalm 22.3, it says this, Yet you are holy, get this imagery now, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Enthroned means to dwell or to inhabit or to exist. What the psalmist is declaring is, God, when we praise you, our actual praise is we're singing it out. This is the place that you dwell. And I love that, that our worship can create a throne for God to dwell and to meet us. And and any of you that have ever lost sight of yourself and truly engaged God in worship and felt his presence, you know exactly what the psalmist is talking about. That there is this incredible supernatural opportunity that we have when we worship God to be met by God and for him to do supernatural things in our lives. I, I've told you this numerous times, but I have, my life has been radically transformed in times of worship. I, have felt, I was felt called to the ministry in a time of worship. God, in a time of worship, showed me the, the specific place to go that has led me here to Lancaster, Ohio. In times of worship, I have been renewed in my spirit. In times of worship, I have been overcome by God's grace to give me strength to do another day. When we worship God, and I, wanna, I want you to hear me on this. When I talk about worship, I'm talking about getting outside of our comfort zone. I can't stress enough the importance of physically worshiping God lifting our hands, bowing our heads, kneeling down, dancing before God, clapping, physically responding. Why? Because first and foremost, the scriptures command us to do it. It's the way that God has told us to approach him. But we are by nature physical beings. We respond physically. When, when I come home and I see my kids, like when we got back from Africa, I didn't walk into the room and go, children, <laughs> child, you know? You go and you're happy to see them and you hug them, and there's like genuine joy, and you physically respond. And when you go to a sporting event and something exciting happens, your hands go up. And when when there's like a shock, when there's energy, like we physically respond, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, there's something powerful about physically responding to God. Because he meets us. He meets us in our worship. And then lastly, you see God in his body. This is the language that he used. This is the church and his community. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. You can read the whole chapter of 12 to get a better understanding. But he says, now you are, talking to Christians, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. This is a remarkable imagery. The body of Christ here on earth. You want to know where Jesus is here on earth? You want to know where his body is here on earth? It's in his community. It's in his church. And yet so many, hear me, This is going to be convicting. It's going to be hard-hitting, and I want it to be. So many people do not prioritize church. They do not prioritize the community of church. And then you wonder why you don't sense God's presence. You know where God is? He's where his body is. He's working. Think about Matthew 25. In Matthew 25, if you don't know, go read it later today. Matthew 25, when God separates the people, he tells them. He goes, I don't know you. And they're, they're shocked. Like, what do you mean we don't know you? And he goes, well, let me tell you. When I was naked, there's a certain group who clothed me. When I was hungry, there was a certain group who fed me. When I was thirsty, there was a certain group who gave me drink. When I was in prison, there was a certain group who came and visited me. And they're like, when were you all of those things? And Jesus goes, when you did it to the least of them, you did it to me. 
What he was talking about is his hands and his feet here on earth. His church and his community and the ministries as they're operating. He goes, those are the people I know. And so many people disconnect from the body of Christ. They disconnect from church. And I, this is, there's no soft way to word this. It's because we've convinced our world that your wants and your desires should be your focus. And so people determine whether or not they're going to go to church based on how they feel that day. What's it going to do for me today? What, well, based on my schedule. And they lose sight of what God's calling us to do is to get our eyes off of us, to get our eyes on him and what he's doing in the world and what he promises us. He'll meet us there. His power and his anointing is there. And so when we look at these things, I want you to think back. We've given eight. I'll go through them quickly. You seek God by obeying God. You seek God by destroying idols. You see God in confession and repentance. You see God in giving to God. You see God in his word. You seek him in prayer in the Holy of Holies. You seek him in praise. You seek him in his body. How many of those are you not doing? How many of those do you need to make more of a priority in your life? Because I'm going to end with these truths. If you want to be closer to God, you must seek God. That's where we began. But then note this. The degree in which you seek God will determine the depth of your relationship with God. He is there, he is open, he has invited you, but you make the choice of the depth of your relationship with God. So here's what I want you to do, is I want you to get your fingers ready to make a number. How many of these do you need to emphasize more in your life? For me, it's two. Right now, as I've been studying, it's two. Hold up your hands and show me how many. Did you guys think through? All right. The reason why I did that, this is a safe environment. Put your hands down. It's not to embarrass. We are a group of gathering. We all have the same heart. We want to get closer to Jesus, right? And so by me holding up my two, I'm saying, hey, pray for me this week, will you? Will you pray that God will help me in the two that I need to make more priority in my life? And though I don't, didn't see every single person, I'm going to pray for you as a group and pray for yourself and make this commitment because seeking God is the, is the purpose and value of life. We bow your heads. God, I'm so thankful that you allow us to do this. You allow us to be challenged. You allow us to be convicted. You allow us to respond to you and to find you. God, you're not messing with us. You're not a manipulator. You're a loving, present God who wants his children to seek after him. So Lord, help us do that. As we even worship now, help us to feel your presence. And this week, as we go about our lives, help us to reprioritize what we need to, to make you the priority. And God, always we'll give you the glory. We pray this in your name. Amen.